some of you are like, why does he always sit in the chair? Why does he always have that table? I'll tell you why. Um, if you've ever been to a high school youth group or middle school youth group, I can't stand still, okay? Like, I will be down here, or I will be, like, in the aisles talking to you guys. So for the sake of the screens, okay, I'm going to sit, okay? I can stand. I, I hope you know that. But that's why I'm sitting. Okay, so if you would, would you um, open your Bibles to the book of Joshua? It's the sixth book of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you should find one somewhere in the seats around you. If you don't own a Bible, you can take one of those. Um, if you'd like a nicer one, I'm sure there's a nice leather one um, in the office in the lost and found. It might have somebody else's name on it, but I'd rather it be red, okay, than sit in the office. So there you go. Okay, so, and if you're following along on a tablet or your phone or whatever, I'll be in the English Standard Version. Okay, so as I was praying through um, what God might have for our students today and for us as a whole, okay, um, God put on my heart the story of Joshua's life. And Joshua was given an incredible responsibility by God. Okay, he had to learn to, to trust God in the middle of impossible circumstances, to trust in times of blessing as well as times of doubt and failure. And in the end, Joshua lived his life well. He, he faithfully served the Lord and led the people of Israel well. And the lessons that we can learn from Joshua's life apply to students, okay, to our seniors who are leaving, to our students who are still here, but as well as, as the rest of us, whether, whether you're a single person, whether you're a parent, whether you're a married person, whether you're not as young as some of the rest of us. Um, I always forget how to say that. If you, are, if you are advanced and wise, this is for you still, okay? So it's for all of us. So I hope that you're as excited as I am today because God has something to say to, to each one of us, okay? So before we get into this, let me kind of give you a roadmap of where we'll be going today. Um, we're going to spend some time in the first nine verses of Joshua. Um, we are going to try to get a feel um, and, and understand the weight of what takes place between God and Joshua here in the beginning and what he was actually called to do in his life. And then after that, we're going to go a little deeper into the book and we are going to see how Joshua actually lived that out. Okay, and see if we can learn a few things, gain a few tools to take home with us to use in our own lives. So if you would, chapter 1, verse 1 of Joshua. It reads, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' his assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So this book, it starts off at sort of a running pace, okay? It's a continuing story of what's already been going on in the first few books of the Old Testament. And Moses is dead. God comes to Joshua and says, all right, it's your time now, okay? All those years that you spent with Moses, I've been preparing you and training you for this moment. You're the one I've set apart to bring my people, to lead my people into the promised land. And you know all those wicked and scary nations that are currently in the land, the ones that are standing in your way? Don't even worry about it. 
Don't worry about them. No one will be able to stand against you. Okay, God pretty much tells Joshua that he and the people will be given a sure victory in the land. Every foe will be defeated and all the land will be completely theirs. He assures Joshua that this will be the reality because it'll be God that goes with them. It'll be God that leads them and assures the victory for them. So if you're Joshua, this is pretty much the best news ever, okay? One of my favorite movies growing up was the 1993 film, The Sandlot, okay? Yeah, it came out when I was 11 years old, and my friends and I would watch the movie over and over and over and over again, okay? We could quote the entire movie by memory, and often we usually did. So it probably was really horrible to watch it with us because you couldn't hear a thing because we're just quoting it and quoting it. Maybe you guys have those movies, okay? Sandlot was that movie for me. Now, in the beginning of the movie, we're, we're introduced to this character, Scotty Smalls, okay? His, his family has just moved into, neighbor, into the neighborhood, but the summer has just started. School's already gotten out, and he's trying to make friends. But all the other boys in the neighborhood are obsessed with baseball, problem is, Scotty Smalls is horrible at baseball. He's never played a game in his life. He doesn't even know how to catch a ball. He doesn't know how to do anything. So he has nothing in common with these boys. But then one day, out of the blue, a boy named Benny, okay, Benny the Jet Rodriguez, okay, he was kind of the, the leader of the, this group of boys that played baseball. He comes up to Smalls and invites him to play. He invites him to come out to the field and join the team. Now, Scotty knows that he doesn't know how to play baseball, and he knows that he can't catch a ball to save his life. Finally, he confesses this to this guy, Benny. He's like, Benny, I, I can't catch the ball. Benny looks at him and says, don't worry. Just stand out there, stick your glove in the air, and I'll take care of the rest. Somewhat dumbfounded, Smalls makes his way to the outfield and does what, he to what he's told. Stands out there with his eyes closed with his glove open. And lo and behold, Benny takes the ball, smacks a high pop fly into outfield right into Small's glove. Victory. Small didn't have to do a thing. Okay? He didn't know how to have to know how to play baseball. He just had to trust that Benny was the best baseball player that ever lived and could hit a ball into his glove. This is pretty much, okay, what, what God is saying to Joshua, he's saying, Joshua, all you have to do is get out there, stick your glove in the air, and I'll take care of the rest. But there's something else here in the text, a, uh, a warning, if you will, okay? So as you read your Bible, you start to notice that, that when God repeats himself, there is usually a really good reason. And the person he's talking to had better be paying attention because whatever it is, it's super important, Okay? Now, Joshua has just been promised a sure victory over his enemies. But go, God goes on to tell him that even though this is true, Joshua is going to have to be strong. He's going to have to be courageous. God repeats this statement three times. This is not going to be some small or easy task. This is going to be incredibly hard. It's going to take great strength and great courage to follow through, to get that glove up in the air. God wants Joshua to understand the seriousness of the situation. Joshua will have the victory, okay? But this is going to be hard, really hard. But he still needs to do this. And with God's help, he will do this. Now, God promises the victory. He says, but it's going to be hard, okay? Then he continues and kind of provides this little catch, okay? And a condition to this promise of victory, Let's read this in verses 7 through 8. We'll read this one more time. 7 says, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the, hand, or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. God wants Joshua and the people to, to remember, okay, all that God has commanded them and to follow all of his instructions. God wants the people to continue to pursue and to trust him rather than chase their own agenda, 
okay, their own desires or rely on their own strengths or the strengths of others. Those are the conditions for victory and blessing in the land. God is promising his presence as long as they would pursue him and listen to him. God knew that if he let them go off and do whatever they wanted, that they would ultimately destroy themselves. So really, these conditions come from the heart of a father and his love for his children. Okay, let me use my children as an example. I love my kids. Okay, I I want them to be happy, and I will give them everything I possibly can to help them live this life well. But if one of my kids decides to reject my wife and I, if, if they choose to reject God, and begin destroying their lives through drug or alcohol or, or some other way, I would not, at that point, continue to enable my child to continue in that lifestyle of rebellion and rejection of God and destruction of their own life. For me to continually bail them out or continually provide them with the means to use, even though that's what they believe ultimately will make them happy, okay, I couldn't do that, not in love. Because for them, the most loving thing that I could do would be to allow them to to bear, to feel the weight of their choices and to plead with them to return home. Okay, So, so we've looked at kind of this initial call. God comes to Joshua, he says, you're in charge. You're the one who's gonna lead my people As long as you and the people trust and pursue me, I'll give you blessing and victory in the land. It's going to be hard, but all you got to do is get that glove in the air, okay? And let me take care of the rest. And what I'd like to do now is we're going to go a little bit further, okay, into Joshua's life. I want to highlight three things that I believe are are crucial for us if we're going to live well and live faithfully as Joshua did. Because honestly, we could leave this room with the best intentions of the world, in the world. I'm going to live well. I'm going to do this. But unless we actually have the tools, okay, if we actually have the means to, to follow through, our intentions are worthless, okay? So we're going to follow along a little bit more. We're going to maybe think of these things as, as tools or equipment that we might use, okay, to, to play the game well. So the first piece of equipment or the first lesson we could learn is it's going to take trust, okay? And there's two parts of this. The first part is we have to trust what we know. And then there's a story in Joshua chapter 3, just a little bit further, and I'm not going to read it, but you can see that it's here. It's when Israel crosses the Jordan River. This is right after God comes to Joshua and tells him what's going to happen, and then God comes to him again and says, I want you to go, and I want you to have the priests start walking out into the water across the Jordan River, which at this time of the year is raging pretty big. Okay, he's like, I want you to line up the people, be ready to cross and just have the priests walk right into the water. And as they do that, I'm gonna part the waters just as I did with Moses in the Red Sea. Okay, God wanted to use this as a sign for the people that Joshua was the new spokesman and leader of Israel. Okay, and that God was with them and would continue to go before them, leading them into victory. Now, this was something that would have been really familiar for Joshua, okay? He'd seen God do this once before. When Moses parted the Red Sea, Joshua would have been there with the Israelites and he would have seen this. So this would be familiar for him. It would have been familiar even for the people of Israel. They would have heard the stories, okay? Or some of them maybe were small children at the time. But we have to understand that this is still gonna take trust, okay? Okay? He's still going to have to believe that that as these priests step into the water, that God is actually going to follow through on his word, that those waters really are going to stop, that that it's going to be able to part so that the people can cross through. Yes, he's seen it before, but he still had to trust. For me, I kind of think of this like how some of us think of tithing, okay? And I don't mean to talk about money, but here it is. For tithing, for some of us, we get to the beginning of the month and we're like, Okay, okay, I know how much money I have. I know how much um, I have to set aside for bills. I, I recognize that, that God wants me to acknowledge that, that all this money that he's blessed me with is his anyway, and that I should set some aside for, for him to further the kingdom, to, to give to the local church. But this is kind of scary. Okay, I'm going to have to trust a little bit. 
Even though so many times for me in the past, like God has been faithful time and time again. Never have I given a tithe to the church and been like broke, okay? Always through some means or another, he has provided for my family and I. But every time it's like, eh, okay. So maybe for you it's like that, but God is faithful. He's always faithful. And Joshua needed to remember that he could trust God. Even though he'd seen him do it before, he had to trust. He had to trust what he knew to be true about God. The second part of trusting is we have to trust even when it doesn't make sense. Okay, now some of us maybe can relate with this. If you turn to chapter six, I will have us read a little bit of this. So chapter six in in, uh, Joshua is the story of Joshua going in and defeating Jericho. Now, in this passage, Joshua is asked by God to do something that that I'm sure seemed absolutely ridiculous. Ridiculous, okay? And I want you to see this for yourself. So I'm going to start in verse 1 of chapter 6. Or actually, let's pick it up in verse, yeah, 1. Now Jericho was shut up from the inside and outside because all the people <clears throat> because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. So the, the people of Jericho know that the Israelites are coming. And they're a little afraid. Okay, they know that God is going with them. So everything's locked up. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. <clears throat> seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. <clears throat> and then when the priests shall blow the trumpets, and when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall, sh- shall, shall shout <clears throat> with a great shout. And the wall of the city will fall down flat. And all the people shall go up everyone straight before him. Okay, so think about this for a second. The people come to the city of Jericho. They're preparing for battle. They're psyching themselves up. And God comes to Joshua and says, Joshua, I don't want you to go and just lay siege to Jericho. I don't want you to just go up and attack. What I would like you to do is put on a seven-day parade. I, I want you to, uh, to march around the city with all your men, with trumpets, okay? Then on the seventh day, you're going to do a really long parade, and then you're going to yell. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, you, you, uh, you want me to do what? To huff and to puff and to blow the, you're serious right now. Okay. The Jordan River thing at least made sense, right? He'd seen God work in this way once before. The Israelites had seen God or remembered of God working like this once before. But this was some com- something completely new. Something completely different, okay? Something that for most people, probably even for Joshua, sounded a little bit insane, okay? But Joshua had to be strong. Joshua had to be courageous, He had to trust God, even though what God was asking him to do sounded crazy. He had to get his glove in the air in order to catch the ball, no matter how foolish he looked or felt doing it. Now, as you're sitting here today, okay, what might God be asking you to do? How might God be asking you to trust him? Maybe right now he's putting something on your heart and you're starting to squirm a little bit. Okay, that's good. But what is it, if he asked you to do something, would you do it? Could you trust him enough to obey? Now, I remember when I knew God was asking me to leave a job at a church that I had been at for six years, okay? I knew that God was calling my family and me away. But this job that I had had for six years with this church was my social circle, okay? It was where the majority of my income came from. And how was I support, supposed to support my family? Where was I supposed to go? What was I supposed to do? I was thinking, I don't know if you remember this, God, okay, but, but I have five kids, and uh, I'm pretty sure that they need to eat. And so this was hard for me. 
I wrestled with this. I was like, God, what are you doing? And this was scary for me, but I knew it was what God was asking me to do. I needed to trust him to be faithful to us, even though in my head it didn't make any sense. So what might God be asking you today? If you're going to be strong and courageous and live our lives well, okay, then it's going to take trust. Trust in the known, okay, what you're familiar with, how you've seen God work before, but also trust in the unknown, even when it seems ridiculous. Because God is faithful. So get your glove in the air and let him take care of the rest. Now the second lesson or the second piece of equipment we can grab is that we need to understand that sin is a big deal. A big deal. If you remember in chapter one, God had warned Joshua and the people over and over again that that they must trust and obey God and follow God if he was going to give them the victory and blessing, that they couldn't veer from what God had commanded them. So if you would turn to the next page over to chapter seven. After defeating Jericho, so so they put on the seven-day parade, okay? They go, and they go, ah, and the city crumbles, okay? It's like big bad wolf, but backwards. They're the, they're the pigs, and they blow it down. Okay, so this happens. They're feeling good, okay? They're like, yeah, yeah, this is pretty cool, okay? So they come to this other city called Ai, and they look at this city, and they think to themselves, man, this is going to be a piece of cake, Okay? Uh, let's just go to the city. We don't even have to bring all of our guys. We can just go up there. This is going to be no big deal. And we'll just go out there and whoop them. It's going to be no problem. But right away, with only one victory under their belt, they got comfortable. Okay? They, they got lazy and they got a little sloppy. So I want to start reading in verse 2 of chapter 7. It says, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the, man went up, the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, do not have all the people go up, but let just about two or 3,000 go up and attack Ai. Don't make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. Okay, but, but there's a problem here. Let's stop for a second. Um, within the camp, there was this man named Achan. And Achan didn't take God seriously. He didn't really... Um, take God at his word. And he had taken for himself some of the spoils of Jericho. Now God had commanded that, that they keep none of the spoils and that they devote it all to God as sort of a, a first fruits of what God was going to do with the people. Okay? So he says, you take all the spoils and devote it to me and it'll go for my temple and this stuff down the road. But Achan didn't listen. He looks at this. He sees some candlesticks and he's like, wow, these are shiny. I like these. I don't think that if I just took these that God's going to really care, okay? I mean, what does he need these candlesticks for? So when he decided to keep them for himself and he didn't realize that his sin mattered. He didn't understand the seriousness of his rebellion and sin. So when the Joshua sends the soldiers to the city, they suffer a huge loss. They were scattered, and the army and the people are left disheartened. Let's pick up back in verse 4. It says, So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So here the sin of one man brings a defeat for an entire nation. Friends, I need you to hear this, okay? Your sin, okay, my sin, our sin matters. Our sin hurts us and hurts others whether we we know this or not, okay? Our sin hurts our witness, for one. For you to say, oh, I go to church and I'm a Christian and the people around you see your sin, that reflects back, not just on you, but on all of us. Ultimately, it reflects back on God. And this is something that God can't take lightly. There are a lot of things in this passage, if you were to read it, that the people could have done differently, okay? 
First, Joshua doesn't even appear to seek God before attacking Ai. All other instances before this with, with Jericho and then the following, God is always the one who initiates, that comes to Joshua and says, this is what we're going to do. Here's the plan. And then he blesses them. But this time, just coming off of the victory of Jericho, Joshua thinks that maybe he's got this, that maybe he can do this on his own. He gets a little lazy, a little sloppy. He trusts in his own strength that he can do this. You guys, if God is going to be our Savior, he must also be allowed to be our leader and our Lord. We must trust him enough to obey him, to look to him, to wait on him. We have to remember that really he's fighting for us for our blessing and for our joy, not against us, okay? When he, when he asks us to do or not to do something in, his, in our lives, we have to trust that he knows best. And it's because he's a loving father. But let me ask us a few questions. What, what are some of the ways or areas that maybe you are compromising or letting sin into the camp of your own life? Seniors, as you go to college, Okay, what kind of friends are you planning on keeping? What are, who are you going to let influence your life? And really that goes for the rest of us, students who are still in high school or middle school, but also for us adults. Who are we binding ourselves with in relationships? Who are we binding ourselves to in business? Because sin matters. Your sin as well as the sin of those that are in your corner. If we want to live well, then we need to take sin seriously. And we need to remember that sin will keep us from pursuing God and will keep us from getting our glove in the air. Okay, so let me recap real quick. We have um, Joshua's call. Okay, that's where we were in the beginning. That it's gonna be hard that he needs to obey. The, three, the two lessons that we've covered so far are that we need to trust God. Whether it makes sense or not, we need to trust God and we can trust him because he'll be faithful. Two, we need to understand that sin is a big deal. And this last piece is we need the body. We need each other. We need the church. We see this played out through the rest of the book of Joshua. Okay, As long as Joshua and the leaders of Israel were reminding each other and the people of what God had done, what, what God expected of them and the mission that was in front of them, the people followed. The people remembered God, okay? But when those leaders and when Joshua were no longer a part of the picture and there was no longer anyone to remind the people to follow and obey God, they stopped. They got comfortable. They got complacent. and got lazy and forgot God. They stopped obeying him and deserted, and deserted the mission, okay, that he had called them to. In the end of the book of Joshua, they didn't end up even getting all of the wicked nations out of the land. They just kind of stopped, got comfortable with the sin of what was going on around them until finally it infiltrated and became a part of who they were. They had turned away from God completely, You see, God was ready to hit them that pot fly. He was ready to hit them the ball. They just had to get their glove in the air, but instead they turned their backs and threw their gloves in the dirt. You guys, we have to be encouraging each other. We have to encourage each other over and over to pursue God, to keep up the fight, to remember what's important. Okay, just as Lauren shared earlier, it's easy for us to get caught up in the life that's now. Okay, forgetting that we have an eternity ahead of us. Let's remind each other of that. We have to get people around us that have permission to speak into our lives and challenge us and our sin. Do you have somebody in your life that can do that? That can say, hey, I see this. This is a problem. And do we give them permission to remind us of who we are and of the mission we've been called to? You guys have to understand that this doesn't just happen. We have to make this happen, okay? We have to find someone stronger and wiser in their faith than you, okay? For younger people, it's often going to be sometimes someone that's older, okay? For older people, there are some people your age and even younger who maybe are further along in their faith, further along in their walk. 
We need to have somebody that can encourage us and challenge us. If you don't have somebody, find somebody. Okay, I'd say it like this. Find someone that you connect with, that you look at their lives and you're like, man, they're living their life well. And then stalk them. Okay? <laughs> I'm serious. Okay? Ask for permission. Say, say hey, can, can I be involved in your life? Can, 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 can you like mentor me or, or show me what it's like to live well? Because I see how you live and I want that, okay? And if they're not like, yeah, just continue to stalk them. They like fishing, show up at their favorite fishing spot. Oh, hey, <laughs> that's funny. How you doing? Okay, if, 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 if you're a lady and the, the person likes to like work out or, or go to the gym, they're like, join their Pilates class. Be like, oh, that's funny. I didn't know you were going to be here. Like, yeah, you did. You stalked me. That's okay. Okay, because we need people in our lives who can point us to Jesus, who can challenge us. And it's not going to just happen on its own. Okay? We have to be plugged in to the church. And I don't just mean go to church. Okay? It's easy to show up and to go home and to go on with our life, but get plugged into the church, to the life and to the mission of the church. Are you guys in a small group? Are you guys connected with other people, other families that you can bounce things off of each other? Be like, dude, I feel like a horrible parent today. And they can be like, oh, it's okay. I felt like that yesterday, but God was faithful, okay? We need people who can encourage us Are you in a small group? Do you have friends that you hang out with regularly that are from the body that can encourage you? Are you involved in a ministry team? If not, why not? Get involved. Seniors, as you move away for college or for jobs, it's going to be crucial that you get people in your life who are going to encourage you. It's going to be crucial for you to find a church home, maybe a, a campus ministry, a place where people will challenge you to pursue him. You have to be about the fight And get people in your life or you will get lazy. You will get comfortable and complacent. And your sin and the sin that's around you will begin to infiltrate you and overtake you and destroy you. It'll keep you from a thriving relationship with your loving Heavenly Father. Now as I close and the worship team begins to make their way up to the platform, I just want to leave us with a couple final thoughts. I've said this before, and and I want to say it again. Often we read the Bible, and we we tend to think it's about us. Okay? Now, we are supposed to see ourselves in the Scriptures. We are supposed to see how it's supposed to impact our lives. But we need to understand that we are not the main character. Okay? We aren't the champion. We aren't that one that's like that good example. Okay? Most often... We're the antagonist in the story or the person who's just not quite getting it. In this story of Joshua, sometimes we want to be like, yeah, I'm like Joshua. I'm going to go out. I'm going to be strong and courageous and I'm going to live well. But the problem is we're not the main character. Jesus is. Jesus is the greater Joshua. Jesus is the one who successfully is leading his people into the promised land. Okay, he is the one that has secured the victory for the people of Israel. The story whispers his name, not ours. We, we, we're Israel on the sidelines who often are oblivious to what God wants, okay? Who are, are most often stubborn, half-hearted, tend to be incredibly self-focused and selfish, and are often rebellious. When given the opportunity, we turn our backs on God in a moment. My favorite hymn of all time is Come Thou Fount. And there's a line in that hymn that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. You see, that's it. That's our hearts, you guys. Left to ourselves, to our own proclivity, to our own desires, our own natural direction, we're gonna wander away from God. You see, we're just like Israel and we need a leader. We need someone who will come and lead us to the life that we were meant to live. And you guys, we have a leader. We have Jesus. Jesus is the greater Joshua, the one leading his people, the one leading them into the promised land, into victory. Through what he did on the cross and through what he is doing now in his resurrected body before the Father for us. 
And we need to remember that this fight is not over and it won't be over until heaven. So like Joshua, okay, and the people, we do have to be strong and courageous and carefully trust and obey and faithfully pursue and strive to carry out Jesus' mission in this life. This is, he is our only hope of victory. He alone is the source of love, peace, joy, and life. And friends, our faithfulness and devotion to him is required in order for us to share in his victory, to share in his blessing. And he has promised those things to us. So trust him this morning. Take your sins seriously. Okay? Surround yourself by people who will encourage you and keep you accountable. And then do the same for others. Because we need you just like you need us. And all God is requiring of us today is our faithfulness and our best efforts. So get your glove in the air. Let him take care of the rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your heart for us. God, we thank you that you don't require us to have all the answers. You don't require us to know how to live or how to be. You just require us to trust you, to take your word seriously, God, and to do our best to follow you. God, so I pray that this morning that you would help us to take these three tools and put them into practice in our lives. God, that we would be proactive, that we would seek this out for ourselves. God, I pray that you would not just bless the seniors as they leave this place and and draw them to this, but God, for all of us, that we would all live this way. God, have your way in our lives and help us to live well for you. Give us the courage to get our gloves in the air. God, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.